Long before Disney turned the fairy tale of Beauty and the Beast into a masterpiece of an animated musical, and a lesser live-action interpretation, the story's first big-screen adaptation was by the French filmmaker Jean Cocteau. The film finds Belle caring for her father after he lost his fortune. The handsome Avenant wishes to marry Belle, but she rejects him. The misfortune of Belle's father leads to him discovering the castle of the Beast, a hairy monster dressed in royal decadence. When the father plucks a rose for his daughter, the Beast threatens to kill him. The Beast only allows him to go free if he'll turn over one of his daughters. Belle, being the least greedy member of the family, agrees to these terms. Belle is initially horrified by the Beast's scary castle and his furry visage. Over time, however, she comes to pity such a creature who remains isolated. The pity soon turns to love as she begins to slowly show compassion to such a misunderstood creature. The Beast then gifts her magical items that will help her family. He also tests her by letting her go and seeing if she'll return within a week. If she does not, then he will die. After Belle's return to her father, Avenant and Belle's conspiring brother of Ludovic hatch a plan to kill the Beast and take his riches. It's up to Belle to come to the aid of the Beast and show him the love that could break the curse that has been placed upon him. Jean Cocteau's direction of such a fantastical tale was pretty astounding for the era. There's this eerie dreamlike quality for the interior of the castle. The candles on the walls are held by arms that move with the characters. Busts and statues of humans will turn to observe those who enter such haunted halls. I particularly dug this one statue that acts as security by firing arrows at anybody who intrudes. There's so many fascinating and magical features of the beast and his castle. The magical mirror is interesting not just because it can show you the lives of others the same way it did in the animated film, but it can also show a reflection of a person's true character. There's also this glove that can transport Belle anywhere, making it easy for her to jump back between her father and the castle. The special effects for these items are so simple yet effective enough where the film doesn't linger too long on the spectacle of it all letting the relationship of understanding and sorrow take precedence over the whimsy. Even the easier magical elements of a horse who understands your destination with a mere thought do have a certain magical charm to them. There's this quiet yet operatic brilliance to the film. The music by Georges Auric feels moody and eerie, but also has a sort of whimsical grace. The dialogue is kept to a minimum and spoken with simple sensations of a story that is not too dense to understand. Now, the look of the beast for this film went through a bit of an evolution. The initial idea by Jean was to merely give the beast a deer's head, more or less. This idea was struck down as it was seen as too confusing for mixing myths. Also, it probably looked really silly. The decision for the look of the beast ultimately led to some astounding prosthetic effects. The mask for the beast would take three hours to apply. This included everything from the furry face to the sharp teeth. Now, the teeth in particular had to be hooked into the actor's mouth. This meant that Jean Marais, the actor who played the beast, would not be able to eat much of anything. He, he pretty much just had to eat soup while he had this outfit on. There was also an additional hour added for each claw that had to be placed on his hand. So when you look at the beast in this film, you were looking at an actor who had to spend five hours total just to accomplish this look. One can only imagine how much longer the effects would take to apply if the beast were seen in a full furry body. What makes this film work so well is that it doesn't try to soften much of the fantasy. The world that Belle occupies is a cold one of deceit and greed. Everybody seems to be against her. Her sisters manipulate her, and her brother lies his way into wealth, willing to throw his entire family under the bus for more coins. The Beast lives a life of crippling loneliness in a dark and strange castle. He can't stand to be the creature he is, and only views the outside world as cruel and incapable of compassion. It's this dark setting that makes the romance between Belle and the Beast feel invigorating and earned. It's a storybook tale that doesn't feel as though it's trying too hard to wrap a pretty bow around the romance. The love between Belle and Beast feels real, and that both of them are drawn towards a taboo. There's certainly a clash of the beautiful and the ugly in more ways than one with this relationship. The Castle of the Beast is meant to feel as empty as it is cursed, posed with flowing curtains and dark hallways. 
Once Belle comes into the beast's life, however, there does seem to be a certain acceptance of this world. There's a great moment between the two central characters when the beast says, You are the only master here. Now, the beast is referring to more than just his life being in Belle's hands, for her to decide whether or not she'll break the curse. There's a reference in here to how beauty has the power to show compassion, to live alongside the ugly, or cast them out. This is indeed what is present in Cocteau's film. There's a frightening nature to how the beast is portrayed, and a fear that he shouldn't be seen. He constantly tells Belle to avert her eyes, and not to gaze upon him, especially at night. It is only once the beast comes out into the daylight where he starts to show some more compassion for this hermit. The romantic bond can be felt from the sweet and sexual moments, as seen in the moment where Belle takes some water in her hands and the beast laps it up. Cocteau's intent with the film is kind of boldly stated in the film's textual prologue. It roughly translates to this. Children believe what we tell them. They have complete faith in us. They believe that a rose plucked from a garden can plunge a family into conflict. They believe that the hands of a human beast will smoke when he slays a victim, and that this will cause him shame when a young maiden takes up residence in his home. They believe a thousand other simple things. I ask of you a little of this childlike sympathy and, to bring us luck, let me speak four truly magic words. Childhood's open sesame. Once upon a time. Beauty and the Beast is a film that feels as honest as it is magical. The effects of the Beast still hold up well, and the general tone maintains a great sense of a surreal and decadent dream. To this day, it remains as one of the most fascinating and strongest adaptations of this classic fairy tale.